In this video, we are going to look at how we can implement an ALU for the RISC-V architecture. We'll look briefly at different kinds of RISC-V ALU instructions and the structure of what the ALU could look like and briefly look at how it could be implemented in Verilog. So the RISC-V ALU essentially uses the three address mode. We essentially have instructions of the form add destination comma source one comma source two, which basically says that destination is equal to source one plus source two. The addresses of destination source one and source two have to be specified. Now, rather than trying to have the general access to external memory as part of the address, we limit ourselves and say that these addresses have to specifically be focused towards the register file where we have a total of 32 registers. Once again, this is an engineering choice. This was decided by the RISC-V architecture designers and therefore any RISC-V compliant system has to follow the fact that it has 32 registers because a compiler for RISC-V will assume that there are 32 registers to be used. I will have therefore five address bits per register because 32 is 2 to the power of 5, which means that 15 out of the 32 bits in an instruction are used for encoding operands. The remaining 17 bits can be used in order to encode the operation itself. And the way that this is done is by breaking it up into multiple different portions, sometimes called the function code, the subfunction code, the opcode, and so on. What we are looking at over here is in particular this thing called the RB32I, the risk 5 32 bit integer subset of instructions. So what does an instruction in RISC-V in general look like? There are multiple different types of instructions of which we are primarily going to be focused only on the first two types, right? the R type and the I type. The R type instructions have two sources, RS1 and RS2, and one destination. And as you can see, there are three separate places, func7, func3, and opcode that are used in order to indicate what the actual operation is. Why are they split up in this way? Why do we have the operations? Why, why not just have the RS1, RS2, RB in one at the bottom of the op, uh, operation uh, in, uh, encoding, for example? And why split it up in this way? These are choices that were made by the architecture designers based largely on a lot of experience in terms of how you can split up opcode, split up register selection, etc., And also based on some degree of familiarity with how these get implemented in hardware. Okay. Having said that, in principle, changing the way these were allocated and changing the portions that they were assigned to could definitely be done without necessarily making the architecture too much more complex. What is important that you should notice over here is wherever an instruction uses RS1. That will always be, for example, in bits 19 to 15. And wherever it uses RD, it will be in bits 11 to 7. Okay, And that is important because what it means is that the decoder that is actually given the task of pulling out the register addresses knows exactly where in the instruction to look. It does not need to look at the instruction type and then figure out where the register values have been encoded. The instructions that we are interested in for now are only the ALU operations. And this slide essentially shows a picture of only the ALU operations present inside the RB32I instruction set. You can see that the first several values, the first several oper operations over here, these are what are called immediate operations, right? So there's an add immediate, a shift less than immediate, a shift less than immediate unsigned, I believe. You'll have to look it up. So all of the immediate operations essentially have one, rather than having an RS2, they have an immediate operand, 12 bits. So for example, if I just wanted to add the value 100 to a register, I don't nearly need, I don't really need to store something into the register and then figure out how to add the value 100 to it and so on. I can directly put the value 100 as an immediate operand. Of course, the immediate operands are restricted to 12 bits. 
which means that if I want to store a larger value into a register, I need to figure out some clever way of doing it. In fact, what you'll realize is that if I want to store a large, let's say a 20 bit value somewhere into a register, there is no straightforward way of doing it. Right? Probably the best way to do it would be to actually take a value into a register using an immediate add with zero, shift it, then once again, take another value and add it into the same register so that you basically shift and add and shift and add and construct a large value in some way. Now this was considered an acceptable compromise because loading large values is typically not something that happens. If you want to load a large value, that's typically directly read from memory, right? And you don't ne really need to have it hard coded into the assembly language. There are a few more immediate instructions where it turns out that a small part of the instruction directly encodes the shift amount. The rest of the instructions are relatively straightforward. They are the direct three address instructions. Okay. Now, where are the primary changes? You can notice that the encoding itself happens over here, but there are also some changes, for example, here, and you will notice that there is a difference between, for example, these two values, right? On the right hand side, the opcode, the seven bit opcode. So the MSB seven bits, the LSB seven bits, both of them do have some degree of variation, but very small. The primary encoding of what kind of operation is happening in those three bits in the middle. So why do we have so many different bits for the opcode and function code? What is the minimum number of bits for this set of ALU instructions? If you think about it, what is the total number of instructions we have over here? Somewhere around 20, okay? Which means that I should be able to encode each and every one of them uniquely using at most five bits. But I have 17 bits, right? So I might as well use them in some way such that it makes some part of the decoding a little bit easier. And there we essentially come to the question of implementation, right? So what happens inside the ALU? The first things first, I need to take the instruction and slice it out. I need to basically consider subsets of the wires and take them as inputs to the register file address locations, right? The source one, source two, and the destination. Given the encoding that is used for this architecture, that job becomes relatively easy. There's no hardware really involved over there. As far as the opcode decoding is concerned, we can see a few patterns. For example, all add instructions have their func three code, three bits in the middle as 000. All immediate ALU operations have 001, 0011 as the opcode, as opposed to the others, which have a one bit difference in the opcode, right? And the func seven, which is the, L uh, the MSB uh, seven bits, differs only for one or two instructions. Why does it even do this? If you look carefully at it, you might notice that when you write that code, you are very likely to find that there are some variations that you can, or rather you can detect that. You can use that single bit in order to decide whether to turn on or off a particular multiplexer. Right? So most of the time, these opcodes and function codes have been chosen keeping that in mind. At the end of the day, my architecture for my ALU is going to have many different pieces of hardware, adders, uh, shift uh, units, uh, um, logical units, and so on. And I need to activate or deactivate each one of them, or at least I need to have a multiplexer which selects from the different outputs. And the question that finally comes about is, what is the easiest way, way by which I can select exactly the one that needs to be done, right? And by doing so, by having this kind of operation encoding, where I use many bits rather than just a few compact uh, bits, I can, in principle, make it easier to decode some of these operations. So the amount of logic that is required to activate the various computation blocks would, in general, reduce as a result of this kind of encoding. Now, what about the register file? The register file uses an approach called read after write. For example, what we are saying is if I have two instructions, add x3, x2, x1, and followed by add x5, x3, x4, the second instruction must use the value that was computed in x3 in the previous instruction. 
Now, if I'm creating a hardware which finishes each instruction within a single clock cycle, then at the end of that clock cycle is when, end of the first clock cycle is when X3 will get written. And what I'm saying is the value that is used for X3 in the second clock cycle must be that value which was just written. So in other words, I must read after the write has completed. Let's move on to how these could get implemented using a hardware description language. And if you're writing code for the ALU, let's say in Verilog, the first thing to think about is from the description, this is a purely combinational module. There is no reason as such to have a clock for the ALU. It just needs to perform combinational computations, right? Addition, logical operations, and so on. It is possible to have more complicated ALUs that actually take multiple cycles to finish a single operation. We'll get to that kind of structure later at some point. We are not going to think about that now. But from the point of view of an HDL, the important thing to remember is HDLs and in general, the logic synthesis process are very stable and well developed at this point in time, which means that rather than trying to implement or optimize the logic directly at the hardware level, you should focus on implementing the behavior that is expected, which means just use some kind of a case statement rather than actually trying to derive Boolean equations for the control signals for the multiplexers and so on. As far as something like an add operation is concerned, the best way to do it for an FPGA at least is to just use the plus sign plus operation, right? And Verilog will translate it appropriately into the best kind of adder that can be used on the FPGA. In particular, trying to implement something like carry look ahead addition or some other kind of logarithmic addition tree is probably going to backfire because it will not at all be efficient on FPGA hardware. And in this particular case, at least for the RV32i, we want to have a fully combinational implementation and your code also should stick to that. You should be sure that you do not accidentally infer latches or registers. We don't have a clock, so hopefully you don't have any passage kind of signals anywhere, or rather you should not have any passage kind of signals, but hopefully you do not also end up inferring latches as a result of incomplete sensitivity lists somewhere. Lastly, the register file. The register file that we use for the RP32i is a 32 entry register file, each entry having 32 bits. And this is directly implemented using flip-flops. Now this is where the FPGA is really good because 32 into 32,000 flip-flops is actually readily available inside an FPGA. It's not a whole lot. I mean, it is not completely trivial, but on the other hand, you do have that many flip-flops and they're readily available to you. Now, one restriction that the RISC-V instruction set has is that the X0 register is meant to be hardwired to zero. What that means is anytime you read from X0, you should always get back the value zero. Now, why is that? It turns out that that's a choice again, because it actually makes it a lot easier to do certain kinds of immediate operations, loading a value zero and so on. Now, the other alternative would have been that if I did not have a register hardware to zero, then if I wanted to make a register equal to zero, I would probably need to use XOR operation, XOR a register with itself or something like that. That can also be done, but the choice made in RISC-V was you have 32 registers. It's not absolutely essential to use all of them. I should be able to manage with 31. So why not use one address to make certain kinds of operations or certain kinds of instructions easier? So what we actually have is 31 into 32 hardware registers. Now we want to be able to read out two values simultaneously. I can have two read addresses, source one and source two. And remember that it's possible that I actually could be reading out the same value twice. As long as I implement it using multiplexers or something else, that's not really a problem. But in very long, you should not even be thinking at the multiplexer level or rather you need to keep that in mind that for ultimately it should become a multiplexer. But in terms of your code, you are probably better off just writing it in terms of directly accessing the particular memory location or the address location that you have and seeing and confirming that the synthesized logic actually corresponds to multiplexers.
Now, in addition to this reading out two values, we also need to be able to update one value, one of those register values in every clock cycle. And therefore, we will need a decoder and some kind of enable signal at the input side in order to decide which of the registers is getting updated at a given clock cycle. And remember that we need to do this in a read after write manner. The read operations are combinational muxes so that the ALU has to see the present values in the registers. Values are updated at the clock edge, which means that the writing operation happens at the clock edge and for the rest of the clock cycle, the updated values are the ones that will be seen. So this, in other words, summarizes what we need to look at from the point of view of implementing an ALU and a register file for the RISC-V RV32I instruction set.